We're going to have a look at how you get hold of nuclear energy. Let me start off by just drawing you a quick diagram. Okay. In nuclear energy, as you probably know, nuclear energy comes from the nucleus. All right. The form of energy that comes from rearranging the electrons around the outside is chemical energy. Okay? So, if you take some wood and you burn it, if you eat some food, if you burn some petrol or something or explode a bomb, then what you're doing is you're shuffling electrons around on the outsides of atoms, what we call chemical reactions. Some of these reactions can be very fast, very violent, they can produce huge amounts of energy, but they are chemical reactions and they release the chemical energy from the electrons around the outside. Okay? What we're talking about today is getting hold of the nuclear energy, which unsurprisingly lives in the nucleus at the centre. Okay? We've talked about this many times, but the nucleus is massively smaller than the electrons. It's much, think of it like a squash spring. You squash the spring down to the size of the atom, but then to make a nucleus, you squash it down many, many times before <coughs> and smaller. Okay? And that means the amount of energy in the nucleus is much, much higher. And as you know, nuclear energy, you can get from single kilograms of, of uranium, you can get enough energy to destroy cities and so on. Okay? You need to know a little bit about, we did a bit of a review of P2 the other day, and you had a look through the syllabus. You need to know the details of how you get hold of this energy. And it's basically by means of two processes. Okay? Fission, which involves splitting, so that's the word you might want to put next to it, Fission, F-I-S-S-I-O-N, which involves splitting heavy nuclei like uranium. And fusion, <coughs> excuse me, uh, fusion, which involves gluing together, fusing nuclei of very light elements. Okay, there's two ways of doing it. At the moment, fission works okay. We can produce electricity from fission reactors. We've been release releasing energy by fission since the end of the Second World War. And that's great. Fusion continues to be a bit of an issue. We've understood the physics of it for a long time, but a fusion reactor that actually produces electricity, sorry, produces more electricity than you had to put in to make it go, we still don't have, all right? There are a number of reactors around the world where they think they're very close to, to cracking this, but I have to admit, when I was sat at school uh, your age, I was told exactly the same thing. We know how to make a fusion reactor, we just can't get it hot enough for long enough, and in the next few years it might work. So we're going to look today at fission. We'll mention fusion briefly. We'll have a look at, at nuclear fission. And it's quite useful, I think. Have your periodic tables handy. Let's see if we can work this one out. Um, nuclear fission was discovered, again, this is a slightly worrying thought, this was discovered in the late 1930s in Germany. The basic physics was, though, it was done by an experiment which is basically involved putting uranium in a test tube and leaving it for a while and see what it turned into. And you might think, well, that's a pretty stupid experiment. But think about radioactivity. Radioactivity has been around for not that long. People were still basically finding out which elements are radioactive and which are not. And a scientist called Otto Hahn was basically looking at uranium because it was the one he happened to be doing. Other people had done different elements. So you might get, I don't know, copper or something. You'd put it in a test tube, you'd leave it for a long time, and you'd come back... And if there had been alpha or beta decay, what would you notice about your element? Let's suppose you had a, a test tube that contained, let's go back to uranium, pure uranium. If it is giving out alpha, if it is giving out beta, and people at that time didn't know, all right? They thought uranium might be radioactive, it's just a dull grey metal that you dig up. If it is radioactive, if it is giving out alpha or beta, what will you detect small amounts of if you leave it for a while? There's uranium-92-235. If that's an alpha emitter, look back at what we've just done about alpha. If this is giving out alpha, what are you going to have being produced? Say again? So what will that do to this? Can you take four and away from the top and two away from the bottom? What do you get? Use your periodic table. What's the chemical symbol? T8, it's thorium. So if this is giving out alpha particles, then you'll end up with something which is atomic number 90, thorium. Okay? What about if it's giving out beta particles? They didn't really have the technology to detect the particles very well. So they were looking to see if they could find the daughters. 
You leave the uranium for a long time, you come back and you look to see if there's any other elements being, being produced. What if it was a beta emitter? What would you have then? It may not show up on your table. Astronomers will know. After uranium comes, think of the planets. Neptune. All right. So Otto Hahn was doing this experiment. Basically, he's working his way down the periodic table. Take an element, put it in a tube, leave it for a while. Do we get any two places down or one place up? And he did this experiment, and when he came to most elements, he found nothing very much. When he came to uranium, it was really odd. If you left it for a while, what you found is you had uranium with small amounts of barium. Now, you've got the periodic table. What's the atomic number of barium? Is he right? Barium has an atomic number of 57. He's looking for atomic number perhaps 93 or perhaps 90. That's all you can do, isn't it, alpha or beta? And all he could find was traces of barium at 57. And this really puzzled him. Um, many scientists, although he eventually won the Nobel Prize for this, it was the work of a number of scientists um, to realise what on earth was going on. It was a real puzzle with uranium. It didn't seem to just drop down two places by alpha decay or go up one place by beta decay. It just seemed to leap, you know, 40 odd places, 30 odd places down to barium. Okay? Until it was eventually realised, many people have taken the credit for this, but it's most likely to be Hahn's assistant, um, a physicist, very great physicist, who had a terribly difficult time getting a job in Germany in the late 1930s, as she was Jewish. Um, she had to leave this research and go and live in, another, in one of the Scandinavian countries, I think. Obviously, late 1930s in Germany was not a good place for people of the Jewish faith, um, but it was largely her idea that what was happening here is the uranium isn't just chucking out an alpha, chucking out a beta. The uranium is actually splitting, all right? So although her name doesn't appear on the Nobel Prize, uh, the physicist Lisa might have realised that what's happening here is uranium-92 is splitting into barium-57. What's the other half got to be? Her theory's fine, but then why don't we find two elements? If the uranium's splitting, yeah, one of them's barium at 57. What would the other one be? Um, but basically, what happens is the uranium splits into barium, and the other one is krypton. Why didn't they notice the other one? Well, bromine's a gas, but you wouldn't have noticed that. What sort of gas is krypton? It's a noble gas, which means it doesn't react. So Otto Hahn, in his test tubes, is producing krypton, but krypton, you wouldn't notice in a million years. In fact, even if you knew krypton was there, how would you detect it would be really difficult because, of course, it's a noble gas. So eventually it was realised, although the krypton was hard to spot at the time, it was realised that the nucleus is actually splitting. Okay? Can I just, all of this story, none of which will be in the exam, very important idea, though, which many people don't have about uranium fission, people who wrote your textbook clearly don't understand it very well, it is a natural process. Don't be thinking you get poor little uraniums and you start beating them up in a reactor to make them split. Uranium-235 will split naturally, all right? It's a perfectly natural process. It doesn't happen in massive numbers in this room, but it is not something particularly artificial. It's not something that you're making happen but couldn't happen naturally. Hopefully you've got the idea then. Uranium fission is splitting and it is a natural process with some isotopes, okay? With uranium-235 it can happen quite easily. So, this is the uranium fission reaction, and again, this is a bit different to what they have in your book, so make sure you get this right. Here's a uranium-235 nucleus. There are plenty of them. If we dug a core sample underneath your feet, particularly in this part of the world with nice igneous rocks and stuff, you go down and down and down, could you find some uranium? Yes. Not much. There's other parts of the world where there's more of it, but I'm sure there's some uranium under your feet. Are any of them uranium-235? If you look uranium up on the periodic table, you're quite correct, you find uranium-238, okay? If you dig up uranium in your back garden, you'll find it's pretty much all uranium-238, 
Okay? Only a tiny fraction of it is uranium-235. But unfortunately, uranium-235 is the one that does fission. All right? Uranium-238 really isn't interested in doing fission. Okay? Now, what happens then is a neutron, perfectly naturally, a neutron wanders along. Okay? And you might think, again, it's rabbits out of hats. He's just producing things out of nowhere. Well, there's millions of neutrons all whizzing around this room as we speak, okay? Neutrons are completely natural, okay? Um, they don't really have much effect. There's millions of neutrons whizzing through you at the moment. Why doesn't it really have any effect on you? It's neutral. It's neutral. It's got no charge whatsoever, okay? So, you've got a perfectly natural neutron minding its own business, and it bumps into, and this is important... Notice the wobbly line, it bumps into a uranium-235. And again, this is perfectly natural. If you dig down under your feet, that's probably happening. And what will happen then is, and again, many books miss this out, you're going to end up with, think about it, if you put an extra neutron in, you're going to end up with uranium-236. Okay? You won't change the uranium because you've added a neutron, not a proton, but you're going to have a slightly heavier isotope of uranium, uranium 236. Okay? Now, can you put on your diagram, and you need to draw this diagram because the one in your book isn't complete, uranium 236 has an asterisk next to it, which means it is just bonkersly unstable. It's not just unstable like carbon 14, it is so unstable it pretty much doesn't exist. If you look up the properties of uranium 236, nobody really knows because it decays so quickly, it's never around long enough to be studied. Okay? Uranium-236 is unstable to the point of not existing. All right? For some reason, again, this sounds mad, 143 neutrons, 92 protons, uranium-235, relatively unhappy. Put in an extra neutron, I and mean, how would you notice it amongst 143 others, and the thing just breaks down. All right? The extra neutron, a bit like the straw that broke the camel's back or whatever, you're going to end up with the thing just splitting into krypton and barium. Okay, as Otto Hahn discovered. And you've then got, very importantly, also a release of nuclear energy. You don't release all the nuclear energy, but some of the nuclear energy that's locked in the uranium nucleus is released, and you get, as we know, many powers of 10 more energy from this than if you were just reacting the, ele the electrons around the outside. Okay, and this is the huge amount of energy which is obviously used to produce electricity, etc. Okay. Also what you produce are three neutrons. Okay. This reaction produces three neutrons. Okay. You may have noticed it was a neutron that, that started this reaction and it's a, neutron, a set of neutrons that are produced. Didn't take people long to realise if you could get one of these neutrons to split another uranium-235, then that would produce three neutrons, and that could split some more uranium-235s, and so on, what we call a chain reaction. Okay? This reaction produces neutrons, and those neutrons can go on to produce other reactions, in fact, three other reactions if you wanted to, and that's how this reaction can sustain itself, or in the case of a bomb, can escalate out of control. Okay? This is the idea of what we call a chain reaction. Okay? This is not well represented in some textbooks, so please make sure you've got the key points. The neutron that comes in and causes the reaction is going slowly. It's just a natural neutron. Hits the uranium, becomes uranium-236, which then breaks in half, and you produce huge amounts of energy, and three more neutrons. And very importantly, otherwise the design of the reactor won't make any sense, can you show that those neutrons are travelling very quickly? That's important. Okay? Now, this is the nuclear fission reaction for uranium, the reaction that splits uranium and releases masses of energy to generate electricity. And the last thing we need to do, which compared to what we've done today, is pretty straightforward. We just need to have a look at how this determines the design of a nuclear reactor. Okay? But if you've understood how the reaction works, the design of the reactor is relatively straightforward. If you've read the textbook and not understood how a reaction works, You'll look at the design of the reaction and go, why is it like that? So can we use this reaction then? Let's use this reaction to design a reactor. All right. So final thing today is what's the design of a, 
uh, fission reactor, which we've just got time to do. Okay? Very important that you understand why each part is there. For the higher marks on the higher tier paper, they're not going to say what goes where. They're going to say, why is this bit here? What job does it do in the reaction? Okay. First thing we have, again, draw this relatively large because there's quite a lot of things to draw in this diagram. Can you draw yourself a big bucket? Uh, this is... a concrete and lead shield. The first thing you do is you put around the reactor core a concrete and lead shield. One of the things the reaction produces is gamma rays, which are very dangerous, all kinds of other unpleasant things. So you put the whole thing in a concrete and lead shield. Okay. Now, if you are going to, I'll try and do them in different colours just to make it look more jazzy. Um, if you want to do the reaction of uranium-235, then you obviously need some uranium-235. And this is generally, leave a bit of space here because there's other rods going in in a minute. Can you put in some rods? Leave a bit of room because there's some more rods to come in afterwards. But these ones that are coloured in red are the, the fuel rods. Okay? They're not entirely made of uranium-235, but they have large amounts of uranium-235 in them. Okay? So in this reactor, you've got fuel rods. There'll be many of them, not just three, obviously. But in a nuclear reactor, you have fuel rods, which are made of metal, and they contain large amounts of uranium-235. And they are very, very expensive, because if you dug a chunk of uranium out the ground, you know about metals from chemistry. It comes out as a yucky-looking rock. You react away the chemicals you don't want. Can you imagine you're left with a gleaming block of uranium, 100% uranium? The problem is... Most of it is uranium-238. And that's no good because it doesn't do nuclear fission. Okay? Only a tiny percentage is uranium-235. And if you take it down to the chemistry lab and try and separate it, what's the problem? You're trying to separate uranium from uranium. It's very, very difficult to separate. When people go into countries looking, UN inspectors going looking for countries that are developing nuclear weapons. That's what they look for, is the technology to separate uranium from uranium. Okay? Um, so uranium-235, expensive stuff, not because it's mega rare, it's just very difficult to separate that particular isotope from the much more common 238. What you want to happen is you want one of the uranium-235s to split and to send out its three neutrons and you want at least one of those neutrons to meet up with another uranium-235 and cause that to split. So you want... All you're doing in a nuclear reactor, really, is taking a natural process. This process is happening under your feet. Under your feet, I'm sure there's a uranium-235 being hit by a neutron. It splits in half. It produces enough energy from one atom, from one splitting, enough energy to move a piece of dust. Now, a piece of dust contains one with 24 noughts on the end, atoms. So that's an incredible amount of energy from a single reaction, from a single fission. And it produces three neutrons. Now, in the rock under your feet, what's the chances of those three neutrons meeting another uranium-235 next to nothing? There's very little uranium under your feet. Almost all of it isn't uranium-235. If there is the odd fission going on in the rock under your feet, that's it. It never goes any further. All you're doing in a nuclear reactor is putting a lot of uranium-235 near to itself in one place. What you want to happen then is there be enough uranium-235 around each other that when one splits, it can cause others to split and so on. The process happens naturally, but not in enough numbers. Okay? Now, what's the problem? Look back in your book at the reaction. I said it produces neutrons, and neutrons are the things that start it. But what's the difference between the neutrons coming in that start the fission and the neutrons that are produced? Um, That's it. You need, and this is the book, very, the thing very few textbooks get straight, you need the neutrons to be going slowly. Look back at your diagram. You should have the neutron that starts the process going slowly. Because what do you want to happen? You want it to get absorbed into the uranium-235 nucleus. If it's going quickly, it'll just go zooming past. You need the neutrons to be going slowly, all right? Otherwise, they'll just whizzle past the uranium-235. They won't be absorbed to make the magic 236, 
which starts the whole process. So what you do, again, I'm using colours completely at random here, what you do is you put the whole thing in a material called a moderator. Very popular with the examiners, because people who've read some textbooks get a very strange understanding of this. We need the moderator, and as its name suggests, what it does, simple job, slows down the neutrons. You put the whole thing in a material which will slow down the neutrons. Because if you don't, my little drawing here of the three neutrons being produced and then one of them causing another fission, that isn't going to happen unless it's going through a material which will slow them down. Look back at your diagram of the nuclear fission reaction. When the three neutrons are produced, they're going too fast. They have to be slowed down if they're going to be able to split another uranium-235. And, of course, that's the principle of the whole reactor. Okay? So the moderator is our next part. We've got the fuel rods. Okay? The moderator... Nearly done. The moderator is the next part, and it very importantly slows the neutrons down so that they can cause few, uh, further fissions. In some textbooks, you get the idea the neutron comes whizzing in and smashes the uranium-235 in half. Now, that's not right. The neutron comes in slowly, gets absorbed into the 235 to make 236, and then you don't need to help 236 at all. It splits on its own. Okay? Now, that's fine, but you're in danger of making a bomb there. So what we need is another set of rods. Draw them up here for the moment. There's another set of rods up here ready to come in. Uh, these are referred to as the control rods. The materials you can use for moderators could be water. Water makes a good moderator. The very first reactors were called swimming pool reactors. Can you imagine a giant concrete box full of water with some rods sticking in it? It looked like a swimming pool, all right, because they were using water as the moderator. Okay? Uh, graphite, the material you call pencil lead, the grey version of carbon in your pencils, that can be used. Modern reactors, I think, use graphite. You can use waters, various others. Okay? They all have the property that they can slow down neutrons. Okay? Now, the control rods up here uh, do a very simple job. What control rods do, they're made of a material which can absorb neutrons, not slow them down, stop them. It's normally, there's a range of materials you can use, boron is used, I think. Basically, the control rods, when they're lowered in, what they do, if a neutron is whizzing along, about to cause another fission, if it hits a control rod, that's the end of it. It's absorbed, and it doesn't go any further. Okay? And importantly, the control rods can be moved in and out. They're normally on electromagnets, they can be moved up, they can be moved down. Okay? What would happen to the rate of the reactor if you put the control rods in? It's going to stop, isn't it, or slow it down, or shut it, or shut it down. Okay? If you lift the control rods out, the neutrons start to flow happily and you start to increase the reaction. Okay? So if you're in the control room of a nuclear power station, think of Homer Simpson in his, uh, in his control room there. He often, you know, he's just pulling and pushing a couple of levers. In a sense, it's quite a simple device. If you want the reaction to go slower because it's too hot, you put the control rods in. If you want to go faster, you take them out. Most have a fail-safe. They're held out by electromagnets. So if there's a problem and all the power is lost to the power station, if all the electricity is lost, what will happen is the, react the control rods will just drop in and the reactor will shut itself down. Okay? You have to be careful with uranium because uranium has quite a low melting point. If the reactor overheats, you can actually melt the fuel rods. And then instead of having fuel rods, you have a puddle of uranium at the bottom of the reactor. That's what's called meltdown, which obviously you don't want to happen. And your control is by the control rods, which are able to absorb the neutrons. Okay? Final thing, this is all very exciting, but we need to use it to do something useful. So what we do is we put some pipe work around it, and we pump in, final one on your list is coolant. Okay. Basically the reactor core, which is this box that I've just invented, called the reactor core. In a power station it could contain coal that's being burnt. It could contain oil that's being burnt. It's just something that gets hot. From this point on, the power station behaves exactly as an ordinary coal-fired power station. <coughs> but you obviously need to put in some coolant, which will obviously take out the energy. The reactor core gets hot. With all the neutrons whizzing around, the reactor core gets very hot. 
So you pump water around the outside, you put cold water in, take out the hot water, and the hot water then goes to generate, and you did this last year, the hot water comes out to make steam, steam drives the turbine, which turns the generators, which makes electricity. From this point on, it's the same as an ordinary coal power station. Okay? The other reason is also for temperature. One of the most important things in the control room of a nuclear power station is, is the temperature gauge. If the reactor is running too hot, you need to increase the coolant to take the energy away more quickly. All right? This reactor core is going to get very hot, and therefore you need to take the energy away, obviously to make electricity, that's the whole point, but also to keep the core relatively cool. Okay? So the things you should have labelled, concrete and lead shield, fuel rods, moderator, control rods, coolant. Those are the things you could be asked about, and the important thing is you need to explain what they're doing. Try and refer it back to the reaction that we did have on the previous board, the reaction which shows you what's actually going on. The fuel rods provide the uranium, the moderator slows down the neutrons, the control rods can absorb the neutrons, and the coolant takes the energy away. Okay.